Welcome back to Reimagine. Here we are in the 10th iteration of this conference. You know, pretty amazing to, to make it to that big round number, a special number 10. And I, I always like to think back and reflect on, on where we've developed uh, you know, since this conference first started, all the way back in the, in the early part of 2020. Uh, you know, in so many ways, we've changed. Uh, markets have grown and developed. You know, we've been through you know, uh, many months, over a year, well over a year of this COVID crisis. Uh, you know, that seems to have waxed and waned at various levels, but is still fundamentally with us, you know, whether that be in the economic sense, the personal sense, the social sense, the physical sense, you know, this crisis is still very much with us in a lot of, uh, a lot of senses. And, and I feel like we're still living through, you know, the economic ramifications of this, uh, you know, with so much uh, sort of brought into salience, I think, in the, in the mainstream world, you know, uh, inflation is a word back on, on the tips of everyone's tongues, uh, you know, uh, DeFi has, has taken on a whole new meaning uh, for a lot of people. So, uh, you know, I think it's so important to have these conversations at the macro level, at a level that, you know, touches both on the crypto space, but also on the mainstream. Uh, and so in saying that, and without further ado, I'd like to welcome a guest who can really speak to these issues uh, in a true sense. And of course, I'm speaking about Sean Lee, uh, CEO and director at Algorand Foundation. Sean, thanks so much for being with us. Well, thank you for inviting us. Uh, it is certainly a topic that I think many of us are thinking about and, and seeing in the news every day, uh, both in terms of the positives and also the, the curiosity aspect in terms of what we're doing in the blockchain and crypto space. So certainly very happy to share uh, in, in terms of kind of some of our viewpoints and also some of the things that we're actually doing at the Algorand Foundation. Absolutely. I, I want to delve into all of that. But before we do, Sean, I mean, we were just speaking a little bit, uh, uh, you know, before we, we hit the record button, a little bit about your history in the crypto and blockchain space. And I just think it's interesting for our, for our audience to be able to get a little bit of that history and understand the perspectives of the guests we're speaking to. Because with the crypto space brings in people from all areas, you know, those with a coding background, those with a business background, those with a, a legal background, those with no background at all, who've just come to this for the first time. So maybe give us a little bit of your story and your background to help sort of ground some of the conversation we're going to have. Uh, certainly. So, so my background, actually, I'm a, a, a technologist. So I graduated with a computer science degree. My career started uh, with uh, building middleware uh, and, um, and databases uh, at IBM. So, so I, I am fundamentally a technologist at heart. Uh, and I've been you know, very fortunate to be able to kind of over the last uh, 15, 20 years, see many different waves of technology kind of taking shape, uh, transforming industries across the board and also, also transforming lives in terms of what we see every day. Um, so my, my, my interest in blockchain and cryptography, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies and digital assets has primarily come in the form of some of these newer way of doing financial services or offering financial services uh, in ways that the conventional system may, may not be able to do so as efficiently as, uh, as it seems. And, and some of those are rapidly being played out in, in the DeFi space uh, and many other uh, categories that are emerging every day around the world and not just in the developed markets as well. Uh, so so that, that, has, uh, that has been a, a quite an interesting journey uh, you know, for, for, for myself in terms of my career, uh, but also in terms of what we're trying to drive being a core member of the Layer 1 protocol community uh, one, one that is uh, driving a lot of activities and very interesting use cases, you know, ranging from your DeFi and NFT to also a lot of social impact projects as well. And then I think that's uh, obviously matches very well uh, in terms of some of the things that I personally would like to drive. Uh, having been in the technology space and financial services space for over 20 years, uh, I've had an opportunity to work in over, over 20, 20 countries uh, in terms of doing business and consulting and advising various different clients uh, around the regions. So when I see, you know, the, the whole world kind of coming together, uh, you know, in a post-COVID world, looking at innovating and creating new ways of driving business, and a lot of those being sitting on kind of the blockchain and, and cryptocurrency space, uh, I feel very fortunate to be where we are today. And I really look forward to some of the, the, the new things that we can all drive together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and certainly, you know, there there is so much still coming out in the crypto space and so many developments coming out through there. And, you know, and I think about the the Algorand, uh, you know, project and protocol, and I think about what the work you guys do at the Algorand Foundation. I mean, so often, uh, you know, it, it's it's spearheaded by this sort of technologist perspective, you know, trying to, you know, break through those those blockchain trilemmas and, and so many of those elements, which mm -hmm. I, I think are key to what the project that Algorand is attempting to to you know, take on and to develop, you know, there's the next sort of generation of blockchain uh, protocols that are, you know are really able to be 
applied and used. So, I, you know, I want to get out to the macro scale. I want to take it out uh, to that. But before we do, let's delve a little bit into maybe some of the latest projects uh, that you guys mm -hmm. are working on over the Algorand Foundation, uh, maybe some of the latest developments that you have just to give uh, our audience some of that context. For the, for the conversation. Certainly, certainly. So if I if you were to look at the, the Algrand ecosystem, uh, the foundation is predominantly focused on three things. Uh, we focused on ecosystem development uh, across various different categories that we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, we also focused on the token economics uh, as we are the custodian of the, the tokens that are gearmarked towards distribution towards the community to drive those ecosystem development efforts that we talked about before. Uh, and then the third aspect is community the, the, the third aspect, sorry, something just popped up. No the third aspect is actually our um, community governance effort. Um, so as uh, projects like ours continue to be further and further into the decentralization realm, how do we actually put that into action? How do we actually execute on, the, on that vision into, in the most transparent and fair manner as well? So those are the three things that we focused on at the Outground Foundation. And if you think about um, what we do on the, on the ecosystem development side, uh, over the last year and a half, we've really drive a lot of uh, a lot of very, very successful, rapidly growing programs across the board. Uh, starting with a grant program uh, that we announced uh, last April. Um, so far, in in the calendar year of 2021, uh, we've had over 200 applications coming through, ranging from your DeFi and NFT stablecoin, uh, you know, token bridges, and a lot of various different social and educational initiatives as well. And, and that, that give us a, a, uh, a, a sense in terms of where the community is going and what are some of the interests uh, in terms of projects that want to be building on Algorand and why they want to be coming into our ecosystem. And that's very important to us uh, because the more adoptions that we get, the more real activities that we're able to drive on chain, uh, and more importantly, the more economic value that we can drive together with our partners within the ecosystem, that's really what a vibrant you know, blockchain project like ours is really meant to do. So we've been very focused on bringing on board the, the interesting use cases and innovative projects, uh, and then also working with various different institutions, uh, ranging from your kind of conventional institutions and as well as some of the NGOs, uh, that becomes quite important for us to really drive towards. All right. So then, I mean, you mentioned institutions there, and I think that's a good a good point to sort of get into some of the wider picture. And I think where you know the the blockchain world and crypto world touches you know the mainstream financial and legacy financial world. So, you know, uh, there's so many sort of interesting elements, I think, that we can draw on over the course of 2020, 2021 of, you know, this this merging of uh, financial worlds in a way that we hadn't seen before. You know, it felt like uh, we were hitting a new a new echelon, a new step in the in the blockchain development, crypto development to, to bring it on board with the with the mainstream financial world. But, you know, here we are at this juncture in, you know, uh, you know late July, we're filming this of 2021 and the future path, I guess, I would say it seems unclear, but it seems uh, less focused than it was uh, potentially at the beginning of 2021, or at least, you know, from a, from a certain perspective. But I, I would be interested to know your view on how you think that sort of integration of, of blockchain and crypto into the mainstream world is going and whether you think in the current moment there has been a pullback, a delay, or this is merely a blip on a, on a growing radar. I think that's an excellent question. Um, I think actually we are progressing even faster than we were even a year ago. The way I look at a, a lot of the industries in terms of evolution, uh, very often you, you hit this notion of uh, crossing the chasm, right? Uh, when, when a certain technology or certain innovation needs to take, take on the mainstream, it needs to cross that chasm. Now, last year, I would have said we probably still haven't seen where the chasm is yet. This year, I would say we, we could see the chasm now. We haven't crossed it, but at least we can see where it is. So it is really up to projects like ours and other partners and other ecosystem you know, uh, projects in the, within, within the industry to really, really all drive towards it so that we can cross the chasm and then mainstream will take hold. Now, what are some of those things that we need to really focus on? Uh, I, I think there are probably two main aspects that we need to think about. Uh, one is really have real world use cases that touches on the users, touching, touching on the people that actually makes a difference in terms of what they do today using this new technology versus the old. 
that is very important, right? I think a lot the last couple of years with the bull markets, there were a lot of uh, speculative projects uh, that have been driving the momentum, but more from a token perspective rather than actual usage. And I think with the breather that we're now seeing in the markets, that's actually driving through a lot of the projects that have real use cases are starting to shine through. And that is very healthy as far as I'm concerned. And the more we have those, the more people would look at this, not as this kind of mythical digital world that some of us are living in and that the rest of the world is sitting over here, but rather this is becoming mainstream, becoming more adopted across the board. And, and whether that has to do with in, in the payment space or in, in some of the digital assets uh, tokenization space or what, or somewhere in between, I think all of that is healthy. And the more we see that, the better it will be. So that's the first part. The second part I also think is, uh, if, you th if you follow the kind of the regulatory uh, you know, uh, news out there across the world, right? Not just from the US, but also across from the world, there are the, the crypto industry uh, increasingly are getting more regulatory um, uh, visibility, right? Let me, let me just kind of put it at that. And I also think it is actually very healthy. I love regulation. The more there are regulation, the more protection this technology and this whole industry is actually placing to the general public. And for more to be uh, adopting into this space, I think that the healthy sense of regulating and understanding where things are and then crafting some set of policies that, that guides where this industry needs to go is an extremely healthy thing. So I actually don't look at it in, from, a, from a concern perspective. I look at it as, hey, this industry is growing up. This industry is maturing. Companies like ours have the responsibility to actually put our foot forth and communicate and work with the regulators so that we can then come to a space where that actually makes sense for us to continue to grow. I mean, honestly, I've seen it you know, 10, 15 years ago uh, when I first got into the cloud computing space and it was the same thing. I, you know, I, along with the companies I was working for, had to take the regulators into the data center and show them, hey, mm. this is cloud computing. It's not up there, right? There's nothing <laughs> up there, right? It is actually down here in the data center. This is how protection happens. This is how securities are actually de be being defined. And I think the same thing is happening right now uh, within blockchain, within the cryptocurrency space, and it's healthy. And I'm just hoping that it doesn't take, you know, 10, 15 years before it matures. I'm hoping in a shorter amount of time with some of the more leading voices speaking out in terms of the benefit that it can bring, but also some of the areas where they do need to watch out and bring that together, bring some additional clarity towards the industry. That's going to be healthy for all of us to move forward and, and continue to drive through these innovation use cases. Uh, uh, you, you bring to mind a comparative in the in the crypto industry mentioning they're having to explain cloud computing isn't in the cloud. I imagine someone having to hold up a couple of blocks and say this isn't actually what a blockchain is. It's not actually held in these blocks. Anyway, it's uh, it, it is good and, and it's as you say. You know, I think if I were to sum up, uh, you know, some of the notions you put forward, it's sort of that idea, and I come across this a lot in conversations I have with people throughout the space that. So many say that, you know, once you break away from these mad hype cycles where you have you know, massive run-ups in the market and everyone gets fixated on price and all these projects come to bear that, you know, really realistically have no business being in the market and being valued the way they are, that at those points, whether it be a crypto winter or at least just a, a pullback or a breather in the market, those are the points where real innovation occurs. That's the point at which, you know, regulators can pause and, and take a breath. That's the point at which developers can say, hey, let's actually do some good development work without fixating on, well, will this, you know, yield me the, the sort of returns that I'm expecting or, or, or et cetera, et cetera. Would that be a fair analysis? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we're human beings after all, right? Uh, we get excited very easily when there's a, a hype cycle going on. And then we get uh, demoralized when the hype cycle didn't, you know, disappears. But that that is the evolution of of uh, you know a lot of different things that we've gone through, you know, throughout throughout our history. And if you look at technology specifically, you know, remember the dot com, right? There were many hype cycles that are happening, but we don't think twice today on using any internet applications as long as we're comfortable with it and we believe in the privacy and the security aspect of it. We don't think about, uh, think about it as internet applications anymore. We just think about it as applications that we're using on our mobile phone and on, and on, on, our, on our computer. So at some point, you know, portfolio management, digital assets and technologies that are being built on, on blockchain, no one's really gonna, you know, in a few years time, no one's gonna think, oh, that is built on the blockchain. 
I mean, it's going to be part of the fabric of everything that's moving forward. We just need to get to that point. And that to get to that point will take some time, will take some efforts. Um, but I think it's the responsibility for those of us that are in the industry to drive so. And, you know, I mean, I think at, at the end of the day, and this is sort of touching on, on the other point that you came across, we come back to that notion of what regulators are going to do. What are we going to do with, you know, regulation in the space? And it's not you know, perhaps the sexiest topic to talk about, but I think it's obviously so important. It's so critical to the, the crypto and blockchain space to understand how this technology is going to be fundamentally received. And although, as you say, it may end up being the, the ultimate plumbing and architecture we don't even think about in the space, how it's going to integrate and the way it's going to be able to integrate is ultimately going to be up in many ways to regulators' action or inaction on their part. Uh, so I, I suppose I wonder how you see the current regulatory landscape. I mean, there has been some pushback and some would argue that, mm -hmm. you know, now we're at the, you know, the, they'll fight a stage of the, you know, they laugh, fight, you know, they, you know, the saying, you know, they're, we're at the, they fight a stage of, of blockchain deployment and crypto development in a lot of regulatory landscapes. What's your take on it as, you know, Algorand is so involved in many ways, you know, with a lot of regulators and you've been known for your partnerships with governments on various projects. I think uh, both sides are kind of, you know, trying to see where the line is, right? And and the line isn't exactly drawn yet. Uh, now, in, it, depending on the country, let me let me clarify that, right? Uh, right. In countries like China, uh, cryptocurrency is that's the line, right? No cryptocurrency uh, at all within, you know, from a domestic, uh, you know, country perspective. Uh, they look at launching their own CBDC. Uh, the ECMY in in very uh, in very short manner. That's the line they have drawn. So that is, you know, in some sense, there is some level of clarity in regards to what that is. Many may not like it, uh, but at least they've drawn a line. Now, many of the other regulators, the lines are not as clear, um, and it is all for all the right reasons because every every region, every country's got very different market dynamics. So where that line really needs to be, whether you're in Europe or Latin America or in, the, in North America, it makes a very big difference. Now, what we have seen, though, is that um, I, I wouldn't call it fighting. I would call it just kind of probing each other, right? You know, what, where, where, where does things need to be? So project will push a little bit forward, uh, be a little bit more into kind of the, the, the gray zone. Uh, and then the regulators push back and said, well, that's not how you know, we have been handling things for the last 30, 40, 50 years, right? right? So now with this new, set, new alternative assets coming in, and now you're saying it needs to be living in that space, well, that doesn't make sense to me. So they push back. So there's this, this level of you know, both sides pushing a little bit. And eventually, if you really think about it, that line will be drawn automatically, right? Go organically, that line would be there. And people would start to feel, have a comfort level in terms of, you know, from a project perspective, what can be done, what should be done, and what are what are still in the realm of innovation that can continue to push the boundaries in the right direction, and then also where the regu the regulators feel comfortable enough that okay, this is going to have enough protection being put in place where that innovation can still continue to happen, right? So I, I think I, I definitely wouldn't call it fighting. I mean, there are some some cases being fought in you know in court on on spe uh, on special projects. But I think as a whole, in terms of the of the industry, it's just kind of feeling each other out, and that's very normal. And and that process, again, like I said, is very healthy because without feeling each other out, you know, regulators are not technologists. Technologists are not regulators. And then you have economists stuck in between, and they're trying to look at both sides of the world and trying to figure out exactly where all of that fits. So if you have all three of these parties coming together, it takes time to feel each other out. But once that process is done. I strongly believe we're going to come out on the other side in much better shape than where we are because we would have now moved forward in a big step in a way where we now look at the next 10, 20, 30 years in terms of you know, where all of this can really bring. Um, and it's going to look very different than the last 20 years. So, I mean, all right, then moving from the, the, the sort of the broad abstract, perhaps to a, a little more tangible example, or at least a, a more specific example like to think about, let's say, you know, the US as a regulatory space, for example. Now, there's been all that's that's a, a, a jurisdiction that's been accused of, you know, considerable sort of lack of clarity. Uh, I mean, certainly at the federal level, certain states, obviously, you know, Wyoming is held up as this, you know, a place mm -hmm. of, of, of blockchain, blockchain sandboxes and regulatory uh, relative blockchain regulatory freedom. Um, but, you know, then but on the other hand, 
you've got states like New York, which, you know, uh, are actively prosecuting, uh, you know, various projects uh, and have their, you know, bit license requirements and, and, and all sorts of elements. I mean, in a space like the US, for example, uh, you know, do you think that that's going to be still a, a, a problem for, develop, you know, developers wanting to develop in that space? Will they just move to other jurisdictions uh, or do you think they will eventually reach an equilibrium? Uh, you know, where blockchains projects and crypto projects will be able to develop in such a space? Well, yeah, in, in a sense, that's the beauty of the, the way how the United States is being put together, right? Uh, you, you have uh, legislation at the state level and you have legislation at the federal level, and, and it creates uh, a lot of flexibility, but also areas where you can try things. Uh, so rather than you know trying to have a, a single set of policies across all the states that you want to operate in as a project, uh, you may you may be able to try things out in different parts and then see if it expands and see where the regulatory kind of environments evolve and continue to transition into. Um, I, I think that's that's quite interesting, and, and it's the same thing could be said also uh, in the European Union, we, we ha having you know many different countries, but all kind of fall falling under the same uh, economic zone. Uh, in, in terms of development, that's also a, a, an interesting area where you can, uh, you know, projects can really try things out. So, so I, I honestly think, um, you know, over the next uh, next few years, uh, as cases uh, starts to come to light, as different projects and and, and different uh, policies are being uh, written, uh, different, you know, maybe the digital asset framework will continue to evolve and continue to be adjusted and amended. Uh, you're going to get more and more clarity uh, around where things are going to be. And, and honestly, I also think that some of the, you know, maybe, you know, this is just my personal opinion. Uh, I think the regulators may also want to leave a bit of uh, an, an open kind of for interpretation area, right? The whole thing cannot be open for interpretation. I think everybody right. realized that and agrees that. But some part of it can be, because that's really the part where, you know, maybe there's not all the answers had to figure it out yet. And you do need each other to feel each other out, like I like I talked about before. So, so I think you're going to see some stage moving a little bit forward, some moving back or or holding the line. I would say, uh, same thing in in countries in Europe and and elsewhere here in Asia as well. Um, I, I think uh, everybody's watching each other. The thing is, it's not like New York State watching Wyoming and Wyoming watching you know Miami, right? Uh, it, it it is all of them kind of watching. Hey, what's the UK doing? What's Estonia doing? What's right. some of the island countries doing in terms of crypto, right? And then they're also looking at China, Japan, Korea, Singapore, uh, being a very hotbed now in the in the whole crypto space here in Asia. You know, you're starting to see a lot of these things develop, and everybody's watching each other, right? And soon enough, there's going to be a common denominator, a common understanding across the board, and you're going to see regulation. I believe getting closer and closer towards that equilibrium, but it takes time to get to that point. So it's not state, state state to state, country to country. I think it's all of them. Uh, and, and it's fascinating to see. Yeah, it certainly is fascinating to see. And, and I guess, as you say, it is a debate we'll have to see play out, you know, maybe over the next few cycles, uh, you know, of sort of, of crypto run ups and downs. And we'll, we'll see how the, the regulators play that out. Um, but all right, I, I want to change tax a little bit here, uh, move from the sort of the governmental mm -hmm. and the regulatory space uh, and start to think more about inside the crypto space. Now, you know, there's been a distinct... I don't know if to, you know, some would argue it's a maturation, some would call it just an organic development, but, you know, uh, changes, nuances, developments that have occurred over, you know, the last, you know, 18 months, two years of the crypto space where we've started to see, you know, new whole sectors come online, you know, DeFi has begun to mature to the point where, you know, people are, are using it en masse and we've seen those numbers grow from inside the DeFi space. Obviously, we've got the NFT space as a huge burgeoning growth industry. And as well, I mean, we've seen a lot of new crypto projects come online, new protocols come online for better or for worse. Uh, you know, some bringing new uh, elements into the space, some, uh, let's say, not so contributory. Um, but, you know, ultimately, people are starting to think about, OK, what is what does a mature crypto market look like? You know, is it a, a multi uh, protocol uh, sort of world? Is it is there one protocol that will reign supreme? Will we end up with 10? What will they do? What will they offer? I'd be really interested, you know, to hear your take on, on what you think the sort of uh, nuance and development of a mature crypto uh, and blockchain space looks like. Okay, so so maybe I'll talk uh, maybe in kind of three points here. Uh, the first thing is it's not going to be a one chain to rule them all, kind of you know using the Lord of the Rings analogy, <laughs> right? It's going to be a multi-chain world. 
uh, that that's uh, I'm, I strongly believe that's a foregone conclusion, right? No one chain can take them all. Uh, just think about the conventional world, right? You don't ha- you don't only have Visa, you have Visa and Mastercard and American Express and many other payment m- methods that are being used around the world, not just one, right? So there's a reason for that because one, you've got competition, you've got you have uh, your price competitiveness, uh, you also have technology technology innovation, you also have partnership ecosystem that are built somewhat differently. So, so I think in the in the blockchain world, uh, it is going to be a multi-chain world. That that's uh, that's I, I strongly believe that's a foregone conclusion. Now, what does that mean? So that's the second point. The second point then becomes how do you interoperate between them? That becomes very important, right? When you have assets that are being created on one chain, one ecosystem, uh, can it be leveraged? Uh, can it be used in in other ecosystem? Thereby creating this, you're driving this economic activity and economic value that are being generated, but not locked in a particular ecosystem. But it's transferable from one to the other. That's where it needs to go. So far, that really still haven't happened yet. I think many folks, many projects, many partners are trying to create these token bridges and and other you know creative ways of trying to bring value from one ecosystem to the other, and it is happening. It is just in the in infancy of where this transition uh, and, and this, um, you know, this advancement is happening. So I don't, I don't think we're there yet, um, but people absolutely realize interoperability becomes very important, both from a tech perspective, but also from an asset uh, that are being created on chain. How does that transfer from one to the another and still respect all the securities, respect all of the, the integrity of what that asset brings? That becomes very important. And whether you're talking about DeFi or NFT, I think that's, you know, that, that interoperability aspect is uh, is very, very critical. So I think that's uh, those are probably the, the two points. The third point I'd also like to mention, though, is if you follow mainstream media, you ask someone on the street and you ask them about blockchain uh, and you, you tell them, you know, ask them about, uh, you know, Bitcoin, right? The first thing they're going to say is, oh, it, it is energy consumption. And the energy consumption is terrible. It's terrible for the environment. Uh, and so on and so forth, right? So they've already built up this image that blockchain is energy consuming, right? And and token assets kills the world, right? It's bad for the environment, which is absolutely not true, right? Uh, you and I both know that there are many types of blockchain out there and proof of work uh, networks tend to consume more energy and proof of stick network tend to consume less. Uh, as a protocol for Algorand, we are uh, carbon neutral. We're actually moving towards carbon negative. Uh, there's a lot of efforts that we're doing along with some of our environmental sustainable uh, partners in regards to driving towards that goal. So that there's a level of education that really needs to happen. But I think you know for chains to be usable, the speed and feed is important. The interoperability is important, but also absolutely respecting the fact that this new technology cannot just drive towards some aspect of tech, but it also have to do good for the environment. That is important, right? So for all of us to drive towards those goals and work on projects that actually encapsulate this notion of carbon neutrality or carbon, you know, carbon negative kind of a, a, a sentiment, I think that's very, very important. So if you're able to have multiple chains focusing on pretend, potentially different categories or different areas within the markets, having interoperability across the uh, across them, but also together consistently focus on the, the environmental aspect, the sustainability aspect. I think all three of those things are equally seen important. And we are seeing that. Obviously, we're driving towards that ourselves mm-hmm. as, a pro- as a protocol, but we're also seeing other projects doing the same thing. And it's, uh, again, it's a, it's a great thing to see, you know, as part of the industry uh, pr- uh, participants here. Mm. And it's a it's a nuanced picture you you put out there just then. Uh, but I suppose I would I'd be interested to know you know from the the Algorand Foundation CEO himself, where do you see Algorand's position in this sort of interoperable uh, you know multi chain world? You know wh- what do you see as the primary role as that develops? Uh, you know, and and in saying that against the other major chains, perhaps that you know look to take dominance. Although obviously we can't know you know which will end up reigning supreme. Yeah, so so we we actually have a, a number of projects that we're working with other you know blockchain protocols as well, right? Creating a, a common kind of smart smart contract language, uh, and also obviously creating various different token bridges and and and, and development tools that allows for uh, interoperability between you know b- between one chain to another. Uh, we also have a number of uh, projects that are that are in the space of looking at 
how do we look at you know a blockchain not only in the public network sense but also potentially in the private permission sense as well there are only use cases especially around the institutional and or cbdc use cases that really encourage uh, and and maybe have the requirements for more private network rather than public so how does the interoperability work be between those uh, is something that we're also spending a lot of time in um our our um uh, what one of the the capabilities that we're looking to roll out in the near future is this notion of a co-chain. So that's a private permission chain uh, that's actually working directly with uh, the public chain. So thereby allowing interoperability and asset transfers from it from a private environment through the public network into yet another private network. Think about you know, bank, uh, you know, bank transactions. Uh, think about some of the assets that are being transferred from a private collection house into another, but using the public chain as a public ledger to record that transactions, but still have the information captured and the smart contracts being embedded on the private side, that becomes important. So these are some of the things that we are working on, uh, you know, on, on, uh, from, from ourselves. Uh, but we also work with uh, various different, um, call them blockchain as a service, blockchain ecosystem, blockchain kind of uh, consortium type of environment, uh, both from a association perspective, uh, but also from an actual network perspective, one one of those example is uh, the blockchain services network that we work very closely with, uh, and that's been taking uh, probably taking shape a little bit more in the Asia side, uh, along with um, some of the Belt and Road initiatives that we're seeing. Uh, you know, work, working together, you know, with the with the various different countries that are part of the trade route and using the BSN network as one of those ways to actually facilitate economic uh, value being transacted on chain. Uh, but the BSN network by nature isn't a chain by itself. It is a conglomerate of chains that are being tied together, Algorand being one of them. So, so that is uh, also a, a, an example of a project that we're participating in where there are kind of industry bodies and consortiums looking at bringing different chains together, creating that layer on top that allows for, for interoperability to happen, asset exchanges to happen. Um, then also obviously mapping on top of that actual industry use cases like trade finance, like supply chain sustainability and so on right. and so forth. So we do see those and we're actively involved in those projects. Uh, but I would say though, uh, they are early, right? These are, you know, right. a, a lot of the chains are creating those facilities to be able to even tap into that kind of a, a facility, that kind of a, an environment. Uh, Algorand is probably one of the more forthcoming ones. Uh, that's why we're involved in those projects. But the, the game is not over, right? This is we're in we're barely in the first inning. Uh, if you were to ask me to use that, you know, baseball analogy, <laughs> certainly so. I mean, and uh, you know, the, the picture you describe, you know, it seems to be a case of practicing what you preach. That idea of creating that sort of fundamental architecture that puts blockchain at the core of many projects, but with at the end of the day, you know, it it being a part of the the plumbing, the architecture, the thing you don't even think about as you're you know operating a more smooth, nuanced, clear, you know, capable system. Uh, into the future. Uh, you know, Sean, I, I want to thank you for taking the time to speak with us and, and really explain out some of these images, some of these, uh, you know, uh, sort of perspectives you have. It's so fascinating to hear that, you know, from uh, from a, a leader in the blockchain space such as yourself. Um, I always like to leave our guests with the, with the last word. So anything you'd like to say about upcoming projects, thoughts, advice to people in the community, anything that uh, that takes your fancy. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, I, I first, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to talk to you and also to your audience as well. So this is uh, certainly something that I, I take a lot of pride in uh, and I love, take a lot of pleasure in as well. Uh, I'm learning as much as all of us are, right? Uh, this is a space that are moving so fast. Uh, and to understand it, you almost have to keep up with it almost every day. And sometimes you feel overwhelmed because there's so much activities that are happening. Uh, very often, and I, I tell my team and I talk to some of our partners, take a step back, right? Uh, you don't have to be running in front and, and trying to you know, capture that, that, that bleeding edge right off the bat. Take a step back and really try to see where the market is going, where the movement is going, where some of the interest areas, you know, if you're a developer, what do you actually want to develop? Is it in the DeFi space? Is it in the NFT space because of the buzz? Or, or do you actually have you know, interest in building projects that actually do some good for humanity, do some good for the social world and the social impact side? Decide where you want to go. Just because the buzz is over there doesn't mean you have to go there. You can still use the technology. You can still use a lot of the, the new innovations that are being created every day, but use it for an area that that feels something for you, that drives you. And, and very often when we work with our partners, one of the first thing we ask them is, 
uh, one, of course, why, why you want to build on Algorand? Uh, is it the technical capability or is it because of the direction that we are all trying to drive towards? Right? And what exactly do you want to drive on and how can we actually leverage our ecosystem in the synergy that we've created between our partners to be able to help various different you know, participants drive towards what they need to do? And I think taking a step back, don't get overwhelmed with this 24 by seven market is moving, you know, left, right and center. There's over a hundred exchanges around the world, all doing different things. Don't focus on that, right? Uh, if you're a crypto trader, obviously that's, you know, that's the area that you live in. Uh, if you're an application developer, you are a startup, you are institutions looking to use this technology and create new business models. Don't try to jump into it and try to do something right off the bat. Take a step back, take a look at where the developments are. Set a goal, set an idea, set a direction where you want to be, and then work with the work with the network, work with the ecosystem, leverage as much as you can, so you don't have to build from scratch all the time. Uh, that's something that uh, you know we 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 talk to a lot of our ecosystem partners about, and I think that's uh, that's certainly helped us uh, as an organization as well in terms of you know where we're driving towards, how we mature, uh, how and how we set our strategies and our plans over the next uh, 12, 18, 24 months. It sounds like exciting developments. It'll be fascinating to see how Algorand manages to continue to develop and grow its ecosystem, uh, you know, as you say, over that time for period and uh, potentially well beyond. John Lee, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. And for all those watching, make sure you stick with uh, this Reimagine uh, conference. So much more amazing content still to come. Mm -hmm.